Um, so yeah, what we'll to look at today are eyes of faith and eyes of fear. Um, and we're going to, I say continue our series in Joshua, we're actually going to start by looking in numbers. Ooh. Um, so we'll look at numbers 13, uh, with, which says, uh, the Lord now says to Moses, send out men to explore the land of Canaan, the land that I am giving to the Israelites. Send one leader from each of the twelve ancestral tribes. So Moses did as the Lord commanded him, sent out twelve men, all tribal leaders of Israel, from that camp into the wilderness of Moran. Uh, so this is you know, God saying to Moses, you've heard of the promised land, I've told you about it, I've told Abraham about it, I've been mentioning it for ages. Uh, now is the time, we're going to do that, send out some spies to scout it out. And so the first thing I wanted to sort of focus on in that is just this idea of recon. Um, so um, this is from a game that I'm playing at the moment uh, called Metal Gear, or Metal Gear Solid 5, if you're that interested. Uh, after preaching on this this morning at a quote of mine, someone else who came up to me afterwards was like, what was the name of that game, please? And like, so like, they wanted to... To give it a go, so I'm sorry if you know whoever that was buys that and doesn't enjoy it at all. Um, but in this, you you have two options really. Uh, the first is you can run straight into like an enemy camp to try and rescue the person, you know, run in, you know, guns blazing, arms flailing, and basically instantly die. Um, is what I discovered is if you do this. The other option is to do recon. You you go up, you know, somewhere slightly higher than the camp. You like lie in some tall grass, get in. Uh, binoculars out, and you sort of go, okay, uh, you get these little triangle things, Peter and Bobby all going, that's a bad guy, that's a bad guy, oh, this building is the building that I need to go into, um, there's some resources over here that look like they might be worthwhile making a detour for, um, this building over here looks a little bit interesting, oh, I could use that as cover, and then all this kind of stuff, just scouting it out, you know, and that's how you be successful. Uh, and yeah, as I say, I discovered very quickly that that is the way to be successful, and if you just run in, you very quickly find yourself restoring from your last save point. Um, but as many of you know, sort of during lockdown as well, I did um, an ethical hacking course. I keep telling everyone that when they mention this, they really need to include the word ethical, otherwise they're getting a lot of trouble. Um, but it's the same thing. You don't just go, I'm going to hack this company and start throwing things at it. The very first thing of the cyber culture is reconnaissance. You look and say, OK, I need to attack this website, for instance. What IP address is it running on? Who registered it? Um, how long has it been up for? Um, what company owns it? Who's you know who's involved in that? And they do some research on people and personnel and all that kind of stuff to try and find that out. Um, but I realised I'm putting this together: uh, computer games and hacking are sort of mind world, but sort of to make this a bit more accessible for everyone else. It's like buying a house. <laughs> when you buy a house, you do recon, don't you? You go to the house and you look around. You don't just buy a house uh, just off nothing. You scout it out, you look around the house, you check the, what you've got, what fit in the room, you just kind of visualise things, you walk around the neighbourhood to get a feel for it, you maybe talk to the neighbours, you work out where it is in relation to public transport links and schools and all that kind of stuff. And then when you decide you want to go for the, uh, the house, your solicitor then does recon. They do check sort of when was this building built, how what was it made out of, is there any structural issues, is there any sort of other things that you need to be aware of, how close is it to the nearest river or lake or that kind of stuff. And you find out all this stuff. So recon is what enables the mission to be successful um, in all of these three cases. To have a successful purchase of a house, to successfully hack something, or to rescue a prisoner from a camp in a computer game, and to successfully take land for God, more importantly, recon is really important. So one of the things we did um, as an Eden team many years ago. Uh, when we first started out, so we got like, some A3 sheets of paper and literally drew out Rivellin and went, you know, here is where people in the church live, uh, here's where other Christians uh, from who attend other churches go, uh, these are the points where people congregate. Um, this road in particular has a, a very suspicious smell most of the time. You know, all that kind of stuff, just working out where resources are, where things are, where people congregate, and how people work, and sort of almost like the flow of people through Rebellion. And just this idea has sort of really lived with me recently about reconnaissance, and it's so easy as a church to put on loads of stuff, and to you know, have a massive program full of things that we're doing, and go, this is what you need, community, rather than actually going to something which the community is involved with and going, hey, what do you need? 
sort of a different way of approaching things, like you know, with line dancing and that kind of stuff, you can go, yeah, it's just something I do because it's fun. But equally, it's something you're going to, you're like a spy in the community, you know, finding out the needs of the community and what they need. Uh, the, it seems like every one of the latest new wine leaders thing um, kept telling stories of when I went to the gym um, and sort of saying you know, how they encountered people and met people and had conversations with people at the gym. I have not been to the gym in about four or five years, so I can't tell you any of those stories. Uh, I can tell you that I did some um, gardening two days ago and now I feel horrible for it, so I should probably go to a gym. Um, but I know for us, sort of before lockdown and before Heather started cutting my hair, uh, we had a lady who lived in our street and used to come and cut my hair. But that was great, because she would tell us everything that was happening in our street. There'd be all these sort of stories of, hey, did you hear what's going on with number 12 and all this kind of stuff, and all the, it's like, oh, no, I don't know, that, what was that, what that noise was at midnight? I had no idea. And, you know, find out what was going on. And so it's important to, for me to think that actually, for, like, God to say, go do recon to the people of Israel, it was important. If it wasn't important, he wouldn't have told him to do it. So for us, it's important to have that sort of, not just let's put on loads of stuff as a church, but let's infiltrate uh, our community, almost. And find out what's going on, find out you know, where people need to be rescued from, what the buildings are that are holding hostages, what the uh, resources are that we can use, all that kind of stuff. We don't have to stick you know, red triangles above people's heads or anything, but you know, we need to know what is going on in the community that we're called to serve. So anyway, um, these 12 spies, go out, uh, look around for 40 days, and then they report back. So picking up in Numbers 13, verse 27, it says, we enter the land you sent us to explore, and it is indeed a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here is the kind of fruit it produces. I really love that, it's like they're just, on, and here's a banana. You know, it's just a random, I don't know what fruit it was they were producing, but it's just like, here's some fruit. Um, anyway, that says, the people living there are powerful, and their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. And then skipping ahead to 31, can't go up against them, they're stronger than we are. So they spread this bad report about the land among the Israelites. The land we travelled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers, and that's what they thought too. So question one. Oh, uh, I forgot to do that, my bad. Uh, question one. Um, are, is that report, are they looking with eyes of faith or eyes of fear? Fear, yeah. But there was one guy, um, so if we backtrack a little bit to verse 30, there's a guy called Caleb who says, Shut <laughs> Let's go take it! Let's do this! He looks and says, we can certainly conquer it, we can do this! He's like, quiet down everyone else, we've got this! And then, uh, if we skip ahead a bit more to verse 6 of Numbers 14, it says, Two of the men who had explored the land, Joshua, son of Nun, Joshua, and Joshua, we're looking at Joshua, and Caleb, son of a guy whose name I can't pronounce, tore their clothing, um, which I was find, find it weird that they always used to do that. They must have got through so many clothes if every time something upsetting happened, you tore your clothes and chucked ash over yourself. They must have just had like a wardrobe full of tattered clothes. They said to all the people of Israel, the land we traveled through and explored is a wonderful land. And if the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us safely into that land and give it to us. It is a rich land flowing with milk and honey. Do not rebel against the Lord and don't be afraid of the people of the land. They are only helpless prey to us. They have no protection. Why did this go out? Yeah. Uh, they have no protection, but the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. So what do we reckon about this? Eyes of faith or eyes of fear? Faith, yeah. Very helpful when your tablet turns off, obviously. Um, so, next question. What's the difference? Why did Caleb come back and say, yeah, we got this, um, and the other guys go, no, nah, there's no way we can do that? Is it that, you know, he was sleeping while the giants were walking by, he was just taking a nap and didn't see the giant people that were walking around who were really scary? I, I don't think so. I think he probably saw the same stuff. Uh, for me, Caleb's uh, confidence is revealed uh, in this part of the verse where it says, and if the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us safely 
into the land. They have no protection because the Lord is with us. The first guys who are like, oh no, we can't possibly do that, say exactly that. We can't do it. There's no way we can. There's no way we can. In our own strength, in our own power, there's no possible way that we can do this. Whereas Caleb looks at the same giants and goes, well, they're, they're a bit scary, but I know a God who is bigger or scarier, and he can take them out. I know a God who takes out giants with a small child and a sling. You know, I've got an amazing God who can do incredible things. So his confidence in his, isn't in his own strength, he's confident in God, that he worships a bigger and stronger and more powerful God, and that if they're up against that God, they don't stand a chance. What's interesting is that at first it just seems like it's Caleb who is sort of, yeah, we can do this, and then suddenly Joshua gets a, a name drop as well. But it shows that sort of looking with eyes of faith is maybe a little bit contagious, uh, that some people will go, actually, yeah, and sort of you know, jump on the bandwagon and such, and go, yeah, maybe you can do this, and like, just need a little bit of encouragement maybe to, to see things uh, through the eyes of faith rather than through the eyes of fear. Um, it does say in verse 10, uh, the whole community began to talk about stoning Joshua and Caleb, uh, which is not ideal. Um, but it does speak to the fact that uh, as Christians, sometimes we'll look at things with eyes of faith, and there will be people there going, no, you're nuts, you're wrong, you can't possibly think that, what are you doing that for, you're mad. And I doubt, or I hope they're not going to try and stone you to death, that would be pretty extreme, but it will certainly come against opposition and people going, no, you're wrong, what are you doing, you're mad. Um, so, speaking of looking at something with eyes of faith and people thinking you're mad, we have this thing. <laughs> you know, so, as a church, you know, we prayed about this building for ages, um, and we went for it despite the fact with earthly eyes there was no possible way we could afford it. Um, we, we couldn't afford a mortgage because we wouldn't be able to afford repayments. Um, have you had one of Ryan's um, Line to Doom things and trustee meet yet? Um, they're fun. So he does this chart, sort of, this is the point where the church's money will run out. And we've never ever hit that, it's always sort of, we've gone on with it, sort of, a, in three months, the church will cease to exist kind of thing, in two months, I'm like, tomorrow, and like, ah! I just never did that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, we looked at that, so there's no way in earthly terms we could afford this. We, we can't do repayments, we can't get money, we can't get mortgage. We're a small church, um, but we knew that God had really spoken to us about it and, you know, prompted us and every time we walked past it, we were all dreaming and going, oh, wouldn't it be lovely? And then, um, I had this whole thing about uh, reaching a community, you need to reach 10% of that community, and at the time it was 335 people, and when we went and met in the building, uh, doing the Alpha course for the first time, and uh, the manager ran up to me and said, would you like to buy a building? Pretty much as I walked through the door, which like, took me, stunned me a bit. Um, we then spoke to uh, the owner who wanted to sell it to us for 335,000, and then I kept getting woken up, but, 3.35 in the morning and looking at the clock and going, God, I get this, but please can I go to sleep? Thank you very much. Um, so, you know, we had this experience, we thought, God is in this. So despite the fact that with earthly eyes and with potentially fearful eyes, which we looked at that and gone, no, there's no possible way, we went for it because we felt like God was in it. And so even now, uh, with the building, it's like every time I walk in there, I have to make a conscious choice. Do I look with eyes of faith or do I look with eyes of fear? Because there's so much in there that still needs doing. Um, and, you know, I was hoping it would be in by this point and all that stuff. But every time I walk in, I go, no, God has started something here. He has given us this building. He finishes what he starts. And he's got a good plan and a good purpose for this building and the church in it. So I have to make a conscious effort to do that. Um, especially for the sort of little scary noises that, that freak me out, which we haven't had in a while, thank you. So next question, what's God's response? So you have these two responses, you have the spies who have come back going, no, there's no possible way, um, there's big scary things there, I don't like it, and Caleb and Joshua are going, no, we can take it, it's fine, we've got God on our side, you can stand against us. So let's try and see what God's response to this whole thing is. So from verse 10 of Numbers 14, it says, Then the glorious presence of the Lord appeared to all the Israelites at the tabernacle. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will these people treat me with contempt? Will they never believe me, even after all the miraculous signs I have done among them? Which is something we find ourselves asking every time we read like a history bit in the Psalms, isn't it? Like, how what's wrong with these people? They saw, you know, they got led by a pillar of smoke and a pillar of fire, they got the, the plague 
leaves of Egypt, they saw water, part, they saw incredible, amazing things, and then it's like the second Moses walked away, like, oh, let's make a shiny golden calf. It was com- it just seems completely bonkers. It was like, and the God here is what just seemed me as well, going, what's wrong with you? <laughs> this is mad. How much what do I have to do for you before you believe that I'm for you and not against you? It says, I will disown them and destroy them with a plague. Then I will make you into a nation greater and mightier than they are. So God's like, I'm, I'm done with you. you this, seriously, guys, like, this is mad. Why won't you trust me and believe me? Moses then has to sort of fight for his people and um, speak to God and go, please don't destroy us. You promised us. Keep your promises, please. Um, and then picking up in verse 26, the Lord says to Moses and Aaron, how long must I put up with this wicked community and its complaints about me? Yes, I have heard the complaints the Israelites are making against me. Now tell them this, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very things I heard you say. You will all drop dead in this wilderness because you complained against me. Every one of you who is 20 years old or older and was included in the registration will die. You will not enter the, uh, and occupy the land I swore to you. The only exceptions will be Caleb and Joshua. So, what was the difference? Those who looked with eyes of fear and said there's no possible way, despite the fact that the Lord has so that now is the time to take it, they missed out on the promises of God. God said, now is the time to take the land that I promised, and they looked with eyes of fear and missed out. Those who looked with faith, um, as we will read in Joshua, get to go into the land and take it and be the fulfillment of that promise that God made many, many moons ago. Uh, one of the things I, I realised reading this, this time around, which I've never picked up on before, uh, was that how long did the spies scout the land out for? Um, 40 days. And how long did they wander around the wilderness? 40 years. Yeah, so it was a, de- a year for every day they chose to look at what God had promised them and say, nah, God's not got this. I thought that was really interesting. So we're now, finally, uh, I, uh, uh, yeah, I did a good job with that. Get to Joshua. Uh, get to the point where yeah, we. We're actually looking at this book rather than the numbers. Um, but everyone over the age of 20 has died. Joshua is now leading the people of Israel. And God has said to Joshua, now is the time to take the land. Or rather, like, take two. The do-over, the chance to make things right. So what does Joshua do? Uh, Joshua sends out two spies from the Israelite camp at Akia Grove. Uh, if you're following a different, different translation, um, it's... it's Hilarious, the NLT choice to say Akia Grove rather than the Hebrew word for place. And I think they've done that because the Hebrew name for the place sounds a little bit naughty. <laughs> he instructed them, scout out the land on the other side of the Jordan River, especially around Jericho. So the men set out and came to the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there that night. And skipping ahead to verse 9, Rahab tells them, I know the Lord has given you this land. We are all afraid of you. Everyone in the land is living in terror, for we have heard how the Lord made a dry path for you through the Red Sea when you left Egypt, and we know what you did to see on and the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan River, whose people you completely destroyed. No wonder our hearts have melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight after hearing such things, for the Lord your God is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. So, oh, sorry. Um, so what's their report? What do they say after having this conversation with Rahab and going back to speak to Joshua? They say, the Lord has given us the whole land. For the people in the land are terrified of us. So eyes of faith or eyes of fear? Eyes of faith. They look and say, God has given us the whole land. So the first guys look with eyes and say, there's no way that God could possibly do this. There's no possible way. There's no way. We can't do this. We can't do it. And these guys, the spies here, say, not just God can do it, but God's done it. They look and say, wow, God has actually already caused their hearts to melt. They're, they're, they're sapped their courage. Their will to fight has been torn away. We've basically won it already, because if we go in now, they just run away from scared. So what's changed? Um, you could think, you know, 40 years have gone by, is there a chance that the giants died off and things have all been a bit easier, people have got smaller, the blades have gone rusty, I don't know. Um, but basically everything is pretty much the same uh, 40 years later as it was uh, the 40 years previous. Uh, there's still the various nations that are inhabiting the land, the giants, as we find out later in Joshua, are still there. Um, 
So not really much has changed, and it's important, I think, at this point to say it's not like the power of positive thinking. It's not that they, they're just like, yeah, we can do this out of nothing, and we're sort of mustering up uh, courage. What they're doing is trusting in God, and trusting that what God has said, he will do. It's not, yeah, we got this, it's God's got this. God's promised, <laughs> and we're going to trust that God is not making it up. Uh, during the uh, prayer mission, when we were down at the Methodist Church, when the Korean guy was speaking there, we were saying about Peter walking on water, and how, you know, when Peter took his eyes off Jesus and looked at the waves, he started to sink. It's a similar sort of thing, you know, Peter, his eyes, when he looked at the problems rather than at Jesus, he, was, he had eyes full of fear and not full of faith, because he'd taken his eyes off Jesus. And we have that choice, don't we? We can look at the problems and go, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Or we can sort of acknowledge that we're there, but keep focused on Jesus throughout the problems and have eyes of faith. And, you know, we looked in 2 Corinthians about strength and weakness, Paul saying all the time about how God's strength actually shows best in weakness. And I think that's true in this. It's not that they're looking at it and saying, you know, we, we can do this with, with our own strength. It's actually them saying, there's no way we can possibly do this, but we know that God can. You know, we know that God is strong enough to do all these giants. We know that God uh, can get us through this. Uh, whose strength are they afraid of? God's, isn't it? They're afraid of God. Oh, what can I say? They, they have the response that the Israelites should have had originally. They're like, have you heard all the crazy things that God did? Why would we mess with that? You know, they have confidence, or well, they're completely terrified of the God that parted the Red Sea and led them through the wilderness and performed miracles and led them out of Egypt. All that kind of stuff. And I think it's, it's, it's interesting as a, for us as a church member. There's a lot going around at the moment that is in the church that is frankly upsetting. There's stuff that is not great. Um, and you can look at the church and go, oh, we've never been weaker. We've never been more vulnerable. We've never been in a worse place almost. But for me, I look at that and go, great. Because at the point where we've acknowledged that we can't do it, we've, we've started to look to God and say, God, we need you. And actually, I think that's a really healthy and really brilliant place to be. And it's doing things like helping unite the smaller churches in Ponty for even throughout Wales because you know, we need to work together and support each other and see God together because we realise we can't do it on our own, which is great. Who would have thought, you know, as Christians, that we need God to do a little heavy lifting? Crazy. Um, but the challenge for us today, really, is what's your report? Um, in the same way that when I walk into the building and sort of have to make a choice, now, do I look with eyes of faith or do I look with eyes of fear? When you are walking around the community, you have that same choice. Uh, do you look around and see unbeatable giants? Do you go, oh yeah, no, the, the ground is far too hard, you know, God will never reach those people. Or the youth are too crazy and out there, you know, God will never break through. Or, but there's such a bad drug problem or whatever it is, you can look around and you can see all these giants. And you can go, oh, there's no possible way. Or you can go, I know a God who slays giants. Despite the fact that they're big and scary to me, they're not big and scary to God. And we're part of God's plan. And do you look at the land and go, oh my goodness, you know, how do we, how do, we do this? Or do you look at Mary of and go, God's put us here. He's claimed it. God has claimed this land. This is our promised land. God has put us here because he wants us to take the land. So... That's my challenge for you today, and I would sort of say it is almost a very conscious choice. I think that there's no uh, surprise really that the majority of the spies that returned with Moses, they returned with the eyes of fear, because I think that is almost a natural response, a human response to look to the future and go, oh my goodness, but what if? Rather than look to the future and go, God will. It's very, very easy to fall into looking at things with the fear, uh, and looking with eyes that are like that. So yeah, I'd encourage you, make the choice um, to, to look with eyes of faith and try and, if you find yourself going, oh, you know, being sort of negative and looking at things and going, oh, you know, oh, I'm kind of, try and catch yourself in that and go, hey, well, hold on a sec, am I looking with eyes of faith or am I looking with eyes of fear? Because, um, just speaking as a church leader, I don't ever want to make a decision for this church based out of fear rather than faith. Um, if I would never make a decision for, yeah, but what if this horrible thing happened? Or, sorry, what if this horrible thing happens? 
what this horrible thing has happened, yeah, we should do some things and change some stuff. Um, but if it's sort of a, but what if, you know, um, you know, robots take over or AI takes over the world, let's, you know, create bunkers and hide up. No, God's got it. God's got his plan and we're part of his plan. Let's have confidence that he knows what he's doing and he knows why he's put us here. So that's my encouragement to you from sort of Joshua 2 ish, but largely numbers, <laughs> sort of numbers talk. Um, but, you know, the guys originally, the, the guys with Moses, they missed out. They missed out on the promises of God because they looked at lives of fear and not the lives of faith. And I don't want that. I don't want that for us. I want us to look at things with lives of faith. And it's not about sort of mustering our things or being delusional. It's trusting that what God has said, He will do, and having confidence in that. So I'm going to pray for us, and then I'll, I'll pass back to Derek. So, Father, I thank you that you have put us here in the boat for a plan and a purpose. Thank you that you have given us that crazy building with a plan and a purpose in store. I uh, pray that you'd help us uh, to look at things with eyes of faith, not with eyes of fear, um, to see you for how big you are, and not look at the giants and how big they are. Um, help us to trust in you and your timing uh, in your ways. Help us to not be like uh, the Israelites who were constantly complaining and moaning about all the things that were like going on despite the fact that you were providing for them daily, you were leading them out of slavery, all the other things that were amazing. Help us to be joyful uh, in serving you and loving you. Uh, may we look ultimately with eyes of faith and not eyes of fear. Help us to Worship you with all we have as Derek continues to lead us. Uh, bless this time. Amen.